In 2006, Pope Benedict XVI visited Turkey, apparently to appear as a healer, because earlier in the year he had offended Muslims by publicly contrasting Christian and Muslim ways of winning souls. While that in and of itself was pretty much a non-event, he quoted Byzantine Emperor Manuel II, who in a 1391 dialogue with the well-educated Persian described the spread of Islam as militant and irrational. Also, the Pope wanted to act ecumenically to help heal ecclesiastical rifts that began back in the 11th century, 1054 to be exact, when the Eastern Orthodox Church broke away from Rome's domination. In working to heal old wounds in the Christian world, the Pope also wanted assurances from the Turkish government that minority religions would be allowed to practice their faiths without fear of repression. Given that Turkey, a once celebrated center of early Christianity with churches at Galatia and Ephesus, is now nearly 100% Muslim, the Pope established quite a goal for himself. No doubt he understood that the conflicts between Christian Europe and the Islamic world began centuries earlier in 632. He also likely knew that the Crusades diverted Islamic conquests away from the Eastern Roman Empire or Byzantium, as well as the occupied Iberian Peninsula in southwestern Europe. It's worth mentioning that the European forces in Iberia were defeated by Muslim armies in 711. In doing so, Muslim forces under North Africans captured what is today Spain and Portugal. By 732, Muslim armies had crossed the Pyrenees Mountains and were in what is today France. They were pushed back across the mountains after losing the Battle of Tours in October of that year. The office of the Holy Roman Emperor was then created in the year 800 to protect Christendom from invaders like Mongols, Huns, and Muslims. The conquest and rule of Iberia by Muslim caliphs lasted until 1492 when Catholic forces under Ferdinand and Isabella defeated the last Muslim stronghold in Grenada. As we'll see shortly, several observers contend that the Christian West started the Crusades for kicks and giggles and for economic reasons, but what they don't tell you is that the atheistic and secular worldviews of the 20th century were oftentimes deadlier. To help you put the Crusades in perspective, Consider that the incursions lasted from 1095 to 1291 at a cost of an estimated 1.7 million lives. That's in 200 years. For the sake of comparison, socialist and communist countries in the 20th century killed an estimated 110 million of their own people between 1917 and 1977. That's just 60 years. It could be argued that Pope Benedict XVI, a former professor of theology named Joseph Ratzinger, wanted to use his trip to Turkey to publicly contrast Catholicism with Islam. He was, after all, a professor with a reputation for conservative ecclesiastical reform. As Peggy Noonan wrote in an article for Time magazine, that pope's been called God's Rottweiler. He was perhaps stirring the pot, so to speak. Believing that his faith has a different worldview, especially as it relates to unbelievers, he wanted observers to know that old-school fundamentalist Muslims that I call Puritans abide by the literal word of the Koran. Consequently, they hold unbelievers in great disdain no matter how apologetic their petitions for friendship might appear. The Pope likely knew that the Koran doesn't obligate Muslims to welcome unbelievers to their tables, whether they're symbolic or real. On the contrary, its perception of unbelievers is alien to some Christians who believe that it is moral to turn the other cheek or to offer help to those less fortunate, regardless of their faith or tribal affiliations. As I'll illustrate in a few minutes, to the faithful Puritan, Muslim that is, any solicitude from unbelievers short of a full conversion is meaningless. It follows that how the Quran depicts unbelievers is important because it frames the mental images that fundamentalists have of them. From some of the writings on Islam, it appears that Western observers are often afraid to be critical of Middle Eastern countries, except for Israel. For some of them, I think that is because of their fear of being labeled xenophobes. But other writers want people to think that Christianity was contrived and spread from Europe, and it was forced upon the peaceful residents of the Holy Land during the Crusades. 
Like many social topics these days, the truth is often opposite of what is said. They argue that Muslim aggression was and continues to be because of Christianity and the Crusades. In their minds, Muslims are minority victims like African Americans in the United States, so they can't be blamed for acts of violence against members of the majority population. <laughs> That's a ludicrous idea, and it's an example of how socialists and communists have come to dominate and pollute the humanities and the social sciences. It's too bad that Nick Berg, a TV tower repairman, can't come back from the dead to tell us what it was like to have one's head slowly cut off by fundamentalists. Officials like former President Barack Obama seem to believe that by admitting a sense of guilt for the West's past conduct toward the Muslim world, Liberal Muslims will be compelled to engage in peaceful relationships with the West. In her lengthy book, The Battle for God, A History of Fundamentalism, Karen Armstrong, a former nun, argues that the recently raging voices of fundamentalism among Jews, Muslims, and Christians coincided with the rise of the modern nation-state in Europe. So she claims that the conflicts began in 1492 in Spain at the Battle of Grenada, Keep in mind that the Battle of Grenada ended the 700-year-long Christian Reconquista of Iberia. She clearly ignores the events in years leading up to 1492. It seems to her that the battle for God began with the militant actions of the Allied Christian forces under Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand. Before she ends her first paragraph, she tells her readers that the obviously closed-minded Christian leaders of Spain forced the remaining Muslims to either convert or leave the country. Not content with this disclosure in the first paragraph, she next tells her readers about the signing of the Edict of Expulsion on March 31, 1499. This act, she claims, forced some 80,000 Jews to migrate to Portugal and another 50,000 to migrate to the Muslim Ottoman Empire, which had been in power since 1453. She also claimed that when they went to the Ottoman Empire, they were given a warm welcome. There's no denying that these events took place, nor is there any reason for claiming that these actions were morally correct. The issue here, like that of many writers, is that she's only telling part of the story. She begins her version of history in the middle rather than at the beginning of the events in which monotheism's long-standing battle for God took place. Likewise, Kelly Nowers, The Middle East, The History, The Cultures, The Conflicts, The Faiths, epitomizes the way in which some secular writers in the West express guilt over partially understood, highly contrastive theological undercurrents that have shaped the events that led to the current conflicts between the secular West and Islamic nations. Nower goes on to argue that Ferdinand and Isabella destroyed a highly advanced Muslim society. In a section titled, A First Clash of Cultures, Nauer begins by explaining that, and I quote, For centuries, while Europe languished in the Dark Ages, Muslim scholars, artists, astronomers, and mathematicians flourished. But as Europeans emerged from their long stagnation, their renascent energies found direction across the Mediterranean. The liberation of the historic sites of Christianity from Muslim hands was a sacred duty. God wills it. A series of long, bloody, often inconclusive crusades followed, and the scars of dishonor they left on the Islamic world have never faded away. Even Al-Qaeda kingpin Osama bin Laden refers to the U.S. and European leaders as crusaders. I should say he did refer to them as that. Former President Jimmy Carter has added his Palestine, Peace Not Apartheid, to the growing list of books written by Westerners. In a sense, Carter's goals are both controversial and admirable. His view is that we can avoid further regional and even global conflict by resuscitating his Camp David Accord and the road, his roadmap to peace. Carter acknowledges that there are extremists who don't want peace, but as if he were negotiating peace between two equally motivated combatants, he takes the higher moral ground by arguing that these minority voices are on both sides of the Palestinian-Israeli divide. 
President Carter and no doubt many others sincerely believe that ending the Israeli-Palestinian impasse would remove one of the major causes of international terrorism and greatly ease the tensions that still have the potential to spark a regional and even global conflict. However, in the realm of the other causes of this religious special conflict, such as demographic transition and the appeal of fundamentalism, which by the way offers a concise explanation of reality while prescribing a path to optimize life, and it may or may not involve the hereafter, or the supernatural for that matter. The former president seems less informed about these things. As he sees it, the articulated ideas he proposes are based on his limited understanding of both Islamic theology and the history of the overall regional conflict. Tellingly, Carter begins his review of the epic battle for God with the creation of the modern Israeli state in, 14, in 1948, not 1498, in 1948. It seems he limits his interpretations of the conflict to questions about Palestinian peace and autonomy. However, to fundamentalists, there are deeper ethnic and theological issues at work here. And they've been operating for a much longer period of time. There are several people in the American media complex that have had well-meaning thoughts and sometimes short-sighted thoughts about the motives of Islamic fundamentalists, including those that the West has called terrorists. And by the way, the Islamic world calls them terrorists too. Their sentiments, however, reveal a rather limited understanding of the geotheological undercurrents that shape the fundamentalist views of themselves, governance, and unbelievers. The American television personality Rosie O'Donnell, for instance, told her audience on a daytime talk show called The View, We need not fear the terrorists. They're just moms and dads. That's some deep thinking right there. Later, she equated radical Christianity in America with radical Islam, arguing that one is just as frightening as the other. Aside from mentally ill murderers, the number of people killed by Christian terrorists over the last 40 years offers her no objective evidence to support her hyperbolic claim. Islam, though not to the extent of Christianity, has been plagued by internal strife, including during an imagined pre-Crusades golden age of Islam in the Middle East. Even Islamic jurists, who have shown some level of tolerance toward Jews and Christians during those years, hold Puritan Muslims in contempt. Islamic Puritans have been described as those who fight society. Several Muslim jurists have argued that any Muslim or non-Muslim territory sheltering such a group as hostile territory and might be attacked by mainstream Islamic forces. According to the noted scholar of Islamic jurisprudence, Khalid Abu El Fadl, the most noticeable characteristic of Puritan movements within Islam has been the power of extremist theology and overt hostility toward non-Muslims and other Muslims belonging to different schools of thought. Muslims who have remained neutral have not escaped the extremist wrath either. Like atheists, liberals, or secularized Muslims are all, are all seen as unbelievers. Because Islam is a highly social religion that places pressure on adherents to categorize humans as believers or unbelievers, an in-grouping and out-grouping process continues to define social interactions of fundamentalist Muslims with the larger population of secularists, Christians, Jews, polytheists, and, of course, liberal Muslims. Looking ahead to the middle of the 21st century, one must recognize that this feature of Islamism will arguably produce a host of unsavory political and social consequences as America and Europe reconstruct their secular spaces to accommodate the arrival of millions of Muslims. In the meantime, writers like former President Jimmy Carter and Karen Armstrong unwittingly provide ammunition to Islamists who are unashamedly enemies of the West anyway and its emerging secularist worldview. While secularism doesn't carry the symbolic attributes of Christianity that Puritan Muslims dislike, it is nonetheless a mindset that classifies the unaffiliated individual as an unbeliever. Puritans, despite being disinterested in history per se, regard these kinds of historical interpretations and admissions of harsh dealings with them as evidence of their own persecution in the name of Allah. On the contrary, High-minded compromises and self-effacing admissions of guilt by Americans and Europeans do not appease fundamentalists. 
Many politicians and secular writers, like those previously discussed, are unwilling or unable to get inside the heads of Islamists to see how they truly regard unbelievers, which to the dismay of those politicians and writers when they find out includes them. No doubt there will be those watching this video who think that the Golden Rule should guide the West's approach to interacting with Muslim leaders, and they probably contend that they will use the Golden Rule to interact with us. Those observers should know that the Quran warns against watering down or diluting its message, which sets the stage for dissension even among the ranks of Muslims themselves, as they consider those who do not take the Quran at its word, the literal word of God. And when our communications are recited to them, those who hope not for our meeting say, bring a Quran other than this or change it, say, it does not beseem me that I should change it myself. I follow not but what is revealed to me. Surely, I fear, if I disobey my Lord, the punishment of a mighty day. Muhammad made it clear that those who dread a meeting with Allah and his prophet are overly focused on their present life, which is typical of the interests of people in secular societies. Surely those who do not hope in our meeting and are pleased with this world's life are content with it. And those who are heedless of our communications, as for those, their abode is a fire because of what they earned. At the end of the day, the Quran is quite clear that it doesn't want Muslims to accept apologies and then play nicely with the West or anybody else that's not Muslim. Islam is made up of two main branches, Shia and Sunni, as well as a dozen or so juristic traditions within them. The fundamentalist is interested in purifying the faith as well as the world because they see any departure from a strict interpretation of the Quran as evidence of unbelief. If the goal of Western writers and political leaders is to take the moral high ground and apologize for actions of people who have been dead for centuries, they must be talking to the far left in the United States and Europe because it will only encourage terrorism and the formation of other organizations like ISIS and Al-Qaeda who smell blood in the water. A scan of the history of the conflicts between the Islamic world and the West shows that caliphs, who are the leaders of the Islamic branches, initiated the conquest of the sovereign states like Byzantium and those in Iberia and North Africa long before the Crusades. If anyone can point to a time and occasion in which mainline Islamic leaders apologize for the conquest of Iberia, North Africa, the Levant, and the Eastern Roman Empire, please post it in the comment sections. I would love to know about it. I'm serious. I would love to know about it. Thanks for joining me on this important voyage. If you'd like to know more about the spread of Islam around the world, as well as how the Quran and fundamentalists sees unbelievers, their community, nation, nature, and governance of space and people, I invite you to read Puritan Islam, the Geo-Expansion of the Muslim World. It should be available in your library and it's certainly available in bookstores. I'll post a link to it in the comments section. Until I see you again, God bless you and yours. Bye-bye.